First Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I might drink, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of, a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in, and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Hallelujah. Master, we love you, God, so very, very, very much, and we are so grateful. Lord, first and foremost for salvation, we're grateful, God, that you've allowed us the opportunity to hear this great gospel message. You've given us the faith, Lord, to receive it and to obey it. For the word of God declares, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Lord, today we do not come before you as the people who have confidence in our flesh, who have confidence in our own holiness or our own righteousness. No, we come before you today, God, as people of sin, as people who are bound today to an earthly existence where sin abounds. And Lord, we claim nothing today before your eyes except that we are sinners in need of grace. Master, today we need the Word of God, for the Word of God is what brings faith into our life and nourishes that faith that helps us to walk with you. Oh God, to strive to walk in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. And Master, today the Word of God is delivered by yet just another sinful man. Just another man who is full of fault and weakness. And Lord, if that word is to go forth and if it is to feed the people of God, it must be anointed of the Holy Ghost. Touch my spirit, touch my flesh, touch my mouth this hour, O God. 
allow me to deliver to the people of God a word from God, even as Elijah delivered to this widow woman a word from the Lord, and that word cannot fail. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch every ear. Allow the hearer God not only to hear the words, but allow them to receive the word with gladness. Lord, that it might fall upon good ground, and it might yield fruit unto righteousness for your glory and for your name's sake. We ask it all today in none other than that wonderful saving name, Jesus, even Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I'm going to tell you today, not since the Great Depression of the 1930s, has our world ever seen such difficult and trying times? We're in the midst of a terrible pandemic. Economic uncertainty abounds and people everywhere are struggling <coughs> with sickness, disease, economic troubles. Oh my God have mercy, there's so much going on today. There's an old saying that says the more things change, the more things stay the same. The Word of God declares there is nothing new under the sun. Got news for you today, folks. Uh, what we're going through today is not something that people have not gone through in the past. Nope. The difference is we have a whole lot more advantages. We have a whole lot more blessings. We have a whole lot more technology available to us today. <clears throat> Back in the dark ages, they didn't have television. They didn't have newspapers. They didn't have a lot of things that we have today. You know, people want to crab about being shut up in their homes for their own safety, for their own good. And yet... Uh, today we're in a place, Tommy, where we can sit at home and we can be entertained and we can be amused, we can be on our computer, we can uh, fellowship and communicate with other people. There are things we can do today that just a hundred years ago they couldn't even have imagined. That's true. So really, as difficult as it is, it's not nearly as difficult as it was during the Black Plague or during other pandemics in years gone by. And yet we have people that want to gripe and they want to groan. Oh, because it's not that it's so difficult, it's that it's different than they want it to be. That's the problem. I can't go where I want to go. I can't do what I want to do. I can't do it when I want to do it. I can't be with who I want to be with. Well, you know, folks, I got news for you. Uh, you're not the first person, and this is not the first time this has ever happened. In the time of Elijah, a drought had struck the land. There was no water. The brook by which Elijah had set up camp and was in hiding, as it were, from Jezebel and old King Ahab. The brook had dried up and Elijah was no longer receiving food from the Lord by the mouth of ravens. I'm going to tell you, God uses circumstance sometimes to move us. When we get too comfortable where we're at, sometimes the Lord will change things up so that our circumstance necessitates our move. Hello now. Oh, I'm going to tell you, God's done that to me more than once. I'm a stubborn little donkey and I can be a hard-headed mule. And don't you say amen. I can be a hard-headed little donkey, I'll tell you what. And the Lord will lay on my heart something. He'll lay on my heart to do something, you know. And I'll kind of linger and I'll linger and I'll delay and I'll be, you know, just taking my time about it. And then all of a sudden, God will cause a drought to come to the land. And the brook dries up. And the sparrows stop coming. Uh-oh. 
Oh, Lord, now i got to do something. I guess I'm going to have to go back to civilization. I guess I'm going to have to go back where people are at. I'm not going to be able to hide by the brook anymore. You're not doing things the way you used to do things. Got news for you. God ain't always going to do what he's always done. Oh, I wish Christians would understand that. I get sick and tired of people getting all cushy and comfy in the blessing of God and getting all cushy and comfy in the way things are going. And God says, um, listen, it's not that I'm not going to bless you. It's not that I'm not going to take care of you because I told you I'm going to do that. My God shall supply every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's the promise of God's word. God said, oh, it's not that I'm going to stop providing for you, but I'm going to start providing for you in a different way. I'm going to do things differently than I have done. So Elijah's instructed of the Lord to go into the city. He said, and the Lord tells Elijah, listen to the language here, it's interesting. And the Lord tells Elijah, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. I've commanded a woman, a widow woman there to sustain you. Well, that would make you think that God's already spoken to this widow woman, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. The Bible said God spe he, uh, speaks of those things that are not as though they were. Sometimes God speaks of things ahead of time uh, in a manner that would suggest he's already done it. But he hadn't. But if he said to Elijah, Elijah, go into the city, I will command a woman there to take care of you. Elijah might have dragged his feet a little. So Elijah, believing it's already done, he had confidence. Hello now. Oh, I'm going to tell you, sometime God will tell you something, and you'll do it, and you'll get to say, wait a minute, Lord, I thought you already. He said, no, I hadn't, but I'm about to. Hallelujah. I hadn't done it yet, but I'm about to. Don't you worry, eternity has no clocks, hallelujah. God has no time clocks. There's nobody keeping time on God. When God says, I've done it, it's as good as done. It doesn't matter. God is not a liar. He doesn't tell fibs. Elijah gets to the city and at the gate of the city he finds a little woman, widow woman, out gathering sticks so she can build a fire. She has just enough oil and just enough uh, flour to bake her and her son one simple little loaf of bread. That's all she's got. And Elijah says, sir, do me a favor, would you please? Now, obviously, there's a good probability that Elijah was known in these parts. It's altogether probable that this widow woman knew who Elijah was. It, it wasn't just a stranger who walked through the gate, you know, and showed up. She had some concept of who this man was. And he said, would you get me some water? And you know, bless her heart, the man of God is someone that she holds in high regard and high esteem. Man, if she said that to most American believers today, they say, get your own water. What's wrong with your feet? What's wrong with your legs? Can't you get yourself some water? I'm going to tell you, folks, there is a major problem in our world today. I understand that a lot of preachers have disappointed us. I understand that a lot of preachers have made fools out of themselves. I understand that a lot of preachers are not living and doing what they ought to be living and doing. But I got news for you today. There are some of us out there who are. There are some of us out there who are doing the best we can do. And we're doing what God has called us to do. And we're struggling to get it done. And those who are doing the work, the Word of God said, Know them that labor among you. Know them. I know who the fruits and fakes are, but I also know who the true men and women of God are. Mm -hmm. I know who the real people, the sincere people are. And I'm going to tell you, it's a sad thing in the church world today that so many people look at a servant of God, a prophet, a preacher, and they look at them with such disdain and such disgust and distrust. 
And there's no respect there. Who I'm going to tell you, you miss a lot of opportunity for blessing when you lump everybody into the same basket. <laughs> you miss a lot of opportunity for blessing when you lump everybody into the same basket. While the prophets of Baal were in the hundreds at this time, and Elijah was one man who was true to God and true to the word of God, a true prophet of God. This woman could easily have said, well, every prophet I know is a fake. Every prophet I know is a phony. Every prophet I know is full of trash and they just say what you want to hear and they just say what makes you feel good. But in the end, every word they say fails to come to pass. Cracks me up how many people want to listen to these teachers TV preachers and these prophets and prophetess, prophetesses on TV who are always talking about how your breakthrough is coming, who are always talking about how money is coming to you, how they're always talking about all blessing is coming to you, and all these things that you want to hear and you want to believe. And then, of course, it never happens. And months and months pass, and you done forgot what they said. Well, I got news for you. According to the Word of God, if what they said didn't come to pass, then they're not a true prophet. They're not genuinely prophesying. Hello now. You need to remember what people say, and you need to remember whether or not it happened. Hello now. Oh, I want to tell you, this little woman could have looked at Elijah and said, Get your own water, preacher. I'm busy. I'm trying to feed my son. But she didn't. She had respect for the man of God. And immediately she stopped doing what she was doing for herself. And she began to go fetch him some water. And even as she was beginning the task of finding some water for him, he calls out to her again and said, By the way, get me a little bit of bread. Would you bring me some bread with that water? Things aren't real good for her. Things weren't good for Elijah. The brook dried up. Things are no better for her because this drought has not just affected Elijah. It's affected the entire land, the entire nation. She turns around and says, I got some bad news for you. I, I don't have enough to share. I don't have enough to give you and still take care of my own family. She said, listen to me. I've just got enough oil. I've just got enough meal, enough flour to bake a loaf of bread and to, uh, to take care of my son and I for one meal. She said, honestly, I was getting firewood so I could prepare what I expect to be our last meal. A lot of us today are struggling. Got news for you, the preacher's struggling just like everybody else is struggling. Amen. <laughs> Things aren't any better for me and aren't any better. Well, they might be a little better for I don't want to stand here and lie. They might be better for us than they are for a lot of people. Thank God Tommy's still able to work from home. And many people are able to work from home, and that's a blessing for you. There are many others, however, who are not able to work from home. And I understand you're in a terrible predicament, a terrible situation. But you know, I'm going to tell you a little secret. There is something about faith in God. There is something about walking with the Lord that changes our perspective. This lady was ready to make her last meal for she and her son. And she had every expectation after that meal of dying. But then Elijah looks at her. Her and he begins to prophesy hallelujah he begins to speak and he starts his words out with thus saith the Lord that means it's prophetic he is speaking as God or for God on God's behalf and he said you do this thing and the meal that you have will never run dry and the oil you have will never cease to flow that little lady hears this and suddenly her perspective changes. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing like hearing from God. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. There ain't nothing like hearing from God. I've been in some awful predicaments in my life. 
I've been in some terrible situations in my life. I've told the story many times before, but it illustrates beautifully what I'm trying to say now. I had come to Texas at the age of 16 years old. I went back home that summer for a few weeks, and uh, the Lord gave me a job painting a house so I could get back to Texas. But when I came back to Texas on a Greyhound bus, I didn't have but about I think it was about $50 in my pocket on the bus. And, of course, I bought meals and stuff as I was coming. But I, I was left with roughly $50, maybe not quite. I arrived here on a Saturday. And I paid about $30, $35 for a motel room in Haltom City. That night, I had my bags, you know, my suitcases packed and all. And that morning, I went to Riverside Church of God. I went to church. That was my church. I put my suitcases in the back in the fellowship hall, you know. Went into the service, and oh, I'm going to tell you, I was scared. I couldn't stay with my aunt anymore. My aunt has some real strange, weird ways of looking at things, and she'd been this way her whole life and hadn't changed a lick, even in her 80s. She's the same now as she ever was. And we'd kind of fallen out, her more with me than I with her, but anyway. And I was scared out of my mind. I know the Lord told me to go to Texas. I know this is where God wanted me. I was obeying the voice of God. But here I was. I had, I think, $20, a little less than $20 in my pocket. I know I had a five, and I know I had three singles, and I think I may have had a $10 bill besides that. Brother Gillum, during the course of the church service, he called two couples up to the front of the church who had just been married. And he put one on one side and the other on the other, and he had the ushers put an offering basket in front of each couple, and he said, we want to bless these couples as they begin their lives together. He said, let's form a line, and I want you to come and give them your well wishes and your greeting. He said, and as you do, he said, just put a little love offering in each basket for these two couples. So they can start out their lives together with a little something from the church. Very sweet gesture on the part of Brother Gillum. So we formed a line and we went through the line. Well, during the whole church service, I just bawling and squalling and reminding God that I was doing what he told me to do. And I was going where he wanted me to go. And Lord, please, Lord, don't leave me stranded now that I'm here. I have nowhere to stay. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I barely have enough money to eat. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, you've got five and three singles in your wallet. I want you to put three dollars in one basket and five dollars in the other basket. I said, okay, Lord. See, I'm going to tell you, when God speaks to you, honey, you'd be a fool not to listen. There are people that God speaks to and says, I want you to support this ministry. I want you to support this preacher. Or I want you to support this church. And bless God, they decide they're going to go another way. They're going to do things different. Oh, that's a bad idea. You do not get blessing without obedience. God does not bless you for disobedience, folks. Anybody who thinks that you're going to reap a harvest when you have not obeyed God, you're out of your bloody stinking mind. Well, I'm going to tell you, I was born and raised in the Pentecostal church. I had more brains than that. The Lord spoke to me and said, put $5 in one basket, $3 in the other. I didn't stand there and argue with God, Tommy. I reached in my wallet. I took out those $8. I got in the line. I greeted each couple, hugged their necks, put $3 in one basket, $5 in the other. After the service, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it's long. After the service, Brother Gillum comes to me and he shakes my hand and he says, Son, I want you to go get yourself some lunch. And as he shakes my hand, I feel something in his palm and so I went ahead and I took it. I didn't know what he was handing me, a note or what. Well, lo and behold, long story short, it was a $5 bill and three singles. Hallelujah. 
Oh, I want to tell you, it was like God said, obey me and I'll show you that I eat Oh, hallelujah. God said, you do what I tell you and I'm going to show you that I'm looking and I'm watching and I know exactly. He didn't give me back ten dollars. Hallelujah. He gave me back eight. That was God's way of saying, I was standing by the treasury and I saw what you put in. Hallelujah. Woo. Long story short, I was going to stay in the church and pray a while. A man, for a young man from the church came in and said, My mom wants you to go with us to lunch. Come with us to lunch. And I kept telling him, No, I need to stay. I've I got to pray. I've got things to pray about. And he come back in. And on the third time, Joe said, uh, Brother Chuck, my mother said, Get your rear end out to the car. You're coming to lunch with us. And if you don't, she's coming in next. And you don't want my mama coming in to get you. I barely knew these people. I barely knew these people, the Bruce's. I only knew them from church. That's the only place I knew them from. I never, I never spent any time in their home. I never, uh, I never spent a lot of time with them at all, to be honest with you. I went out to the car. I got in the car. Sister Bruce said, what took you so long? I told you to get out here. We said, we want to take you to lunch. So we start driving, and after a while, Sister Bruce says to me, so Chuck, now that you're back from... Up north, she said, where are you staying at these days? See, everybody in the church kind of knew what my aunt was doing. And, you know, she had a reputation for being odd and doing some strange things. Sister Bruce said, where are you staying? And like a 16-year-old scared out of his mind, I started to cry. And I said, well, I'm not really sure. I said, I'm, that's what I was trying to stay in the church and pray about. I said, I, I'm really not sure what I'm going to do right now. But, you know, I know God called me back to Texas. And, you know, and she said, oh, well, that's settled. Then said, you're staying with us. She said, we don't have but a small two-bedroom house. She said, our house is very small. It's not but a total of five rooms, she said. But we, every summer, we go out and we do children's crusades all over uh, Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma and different places. We go to churches and we do children's ministry every summer. My husband takes off from work. She said, we have a Winnebago. And it's parked in our driveway right now. She said, and what we can do is, it's all hooked up. Said the water's hooked up, the plumbing's hooked up. Said we've got it all rigged up out there. She said, you can stay in that and you can eat with us and everything. She said, you know, but you can stay in there. That'll be your own little private quarters. God provided for me. He'd already commanded the widow. Hallelujah. Now, he might not have spoken to Sister Bruce before I got in the car and said I had nowhere to stay. But when he did speak to her, she did what he told her to do. We wound up developing a lifelong connection. They became an extended family to me. Those people, uh, to this day, I count them you know, I think of them so highly. And they were precious, precious, godly people. And I had a wonderful time uh, with them. And, and I wound up over the years, we stayed very close. They went on to pastor a church in North uh, Texas. And I went up there and preached for them on many occasions. Anyway, you know, the point I'm trying to make is... God met my need. He told me to go into the city. I went into the city. And when the prophet of God prophesied to this little widow woman, this little widow woman did exactly what the prophet of God had said. Now, listen to me. When the prophet of God speaks, it is one and the same as if God had spoken. So when God said, I have commanded a widow woman... He was going to do exactly that. That's what he did through the prophet. He told her, do this and I'll do that. Hello now. Oh, I want to tell you something today, folks. As a child of God, when you're living by faith, the word of God said the just shall live by faith. We don't live by what we see. We live 
by faith. And as children of God, when we live by faith, we see circumstances and situations differently than the unbeliever does. We see circumstances and situations uh, very much opposite from other people. Sometimes we have so little and we see somebody who has less than we do. And as a child of God, we say, you know what, I'm going to help that person. I'm going to give to that person. They need food. I'm going to give them some food. Or does that mean your cabinets are loaded, that you got food to last you for months on end? Maybe not. But you see somebody else who has less than you do, and you say, I'm going to help them. I'm going to bless them. Why? Because I know God's going to take care of me. I know the Lord ain't going to let me starve. Amen. I remember when I was pastoring my first church, my very first church, I was 19 years old in the church of God. And I was pastor in my first church, and a couple in the church by the name of Leo and Sue came to me. And they said, Pastor, uh, we have a friend, a lady, she's in an Assemblies of God church. She has two children. She's a single mom. She lives on nothing but alimony and child support. She doesn't work. And right now, she is in desperate need of food. She's in a very bad place. And we were wondering if there's anything we could do for them as a church. And I said, sure. Well, we met in a, in a third floor hall that was above the second floor, had office space. And I actually had rented a little three-room office suite that I was using as a living, a living space. The reason I did that was the office suite was only $150 a month, and an apartment at that time, you'd have paid at least $600 a month. So it was a whole lot cheaper. So I, I'm going to tell you a little secret. This preacher's made a lot of sacrifices over the years so I could preach the Word of God. I don't regret a one. I'm not bragging about it, but I'm telling you right now, I've lived in the back of storefronts. I've lived in the basement of church buildings. I have lived in office buildings that didn't have a shower. I had to go to my grandparents house which was down the road about 10 miles to take a shower and get cleaned up uh, I, I had to do things a lot differently than I do today and then most people are accustomed to doing things but I'm going to tell you for the honor of preaching the gospel and living up to my calling and doing what God has called me to do I've made a lot of sacrifices if I run into one person in heaven who tells me they're here because of some sacrifice I made, it'll be worth every sacrifice I've ever made. It'll be worth it all. I'm going to tell you, souls are more important to me than anything in this universe. Well, I said to Leo and Sue, I said, y'all come down to my living quarters downstairs. I said, we can help her. And they came in, and I had one room set up as a little office for the church. Then the second room was like a little kitchen. I had a microwave in there, and I had cabinets and stuff. And then the third room was my little prophet's chamber, my little bedroom. I had a little single bed in there. I went into my cabinets, and I started pulling food out. And I started putting it in a box. And... Uh, putting all this food together, you know. And after a while, Sue said, Pastor, she said, you're emptying your cabinet. She said, you're, you're not leaving yourself anything. I said, I'll be fine. Hallelujah. I said, hey, God's going to take care of me. I'm not worried about me. I said, right now, I'm worried about that little lady who has two children. Now, she went to another church. She didn't go to our church. She wasn't a member of our church. That doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you something. When the only people you'll help are people who are part of your own little party and part of your own little group, there's something wrong with your walk with God. We've got a man who's been supportive of my ministry now for many, many years, and I love him. He's a friend. I appreciate him. That man has kept this ministry afloat many, 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 many times over the last... I've been in affirming ministry about... Uh, 27 years now, I guess. And this man, I met him probably after about four or five years into my ministry, uh, my affirming ministry, but he has kept our work going for many, many years. 
And I will tell you, the funny thing is, when I first met him, he visited our church. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And after the service, I said to him, because I met him at a little LGBT Bible study they had at the, the Gay Lesbian Center in Manhattan, uh, interdenominational Bible study affair. And I met him there, and I invited him to check out our church, and he came. And after the service, I said, so... Uh, what did you think of the service? I hope you enjoyed it. And he looked at me, and you got to know Claude, bless his heart. Nobody's going to be more honest with you than Claude is. And Claude looked at me, and he said, I didn't. I was floored. I didn't, literally, nobody ever said that. Most people will lie to you and say, oh, it was great. And then they leave and say, boy, them tongue-talking, dancing, shouting, bunch of crazy Pentecostal people. I don't want to go anywhere near them. I don't ever want to see them again. But they'll at least tell you something, you know, to placate you. It's one reason why you get disappointed when people visit the church. They talk highly of it, and then you never see them again, you know. Because I didn't. And then he said, well, he said, what I mean by that is, he said, my pastor's old. I've been going to this Baptist church for many, many years. And uh, my pastor, up, he'd been there for many, many years, said he's old. He lost his fire a long time ago. He said, I'm not used to preachers preaching anymore with fire. I'm not used to preachers preaching loudly and boisterously. And I'm not used to the passion in preaching. He said, uh, but I have a question for you. He said, would it be possible for me to support your ministry financially even if I don't attend your church? I never in my life had anybody ask me that question. That, that was a complete mind blower for me. So I thought about it for a minute. I said, well, yeah, I don't see why it'd be a problem. Of course, you know, I'm thinking he's going to give us $20 a month or, you know, $50 a year or something like that. I had no idea what he's going to give. He didn't say, you know, it didn't matter. He just was offering to support us and help us, you know. Long story short, that man has given tens of thousands of dollars over the last 20 years in support of this ministry. See, we didn't have to be part of his clan. We didn't have to be part of his denomination. We didn't have to be part of his group. We didn't have to do things the way uh, that they did them in his church in order for him to support us. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, when you walk by faith and not by sight, when you follow the leading of the Holy Ghost, you don't do for people who, who are part of your group and ignore people who aren't. No, where there's need, you operate in compassion. You see, I titled my message today, Giving. Now you have to look at the way I wrote it. Giving, comma, an opportunity. I didn't say giving an opportunity without the comma. I said giving an opportunity. What a lot of people don't understand is that giving and doing for others and giving and doing for people in need and giving and doing for the work of God are ways that we're able to demonstrate our faith. Mm -hmm. See, you can talk religion till you drop dead. But until your religion gets out of your mouth and gets into your hands then your religion is vain, it's worthless. The Word of God said, pure religion and undefiled is to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. It means you take care of those who don't have. You take care of those who are struggling. You take care of those who have a need. He said, and you keep yourself unspotted from the world. See, there's a lot of people who think keeping themselves unspotted from the world amounts to wearing their hair this high and wearing their sleeves this long and getting their dresses down to the floor. Oh, I'm unspotted from the world. You're a liar, devil, and I rebuke you. You're not unspotted from the world. You're as selfish as the world is. You're as greedy 
enemy as the world is. You're as big a liar as the world is. You're as big a gossip as the world is. Hello now. Keeping yourself unspotted from the world, folks, has as much to do with keeping yourself pure, keeping yourself in Christ, keeping yourself in the mind of Christ, and not allowing yourself to be overtaken by worldly lusts, worldly desires, worldly thinking. We've got churches full of people today. And they're convinced the Republican Party is the party of God. The Republican Party is the political party in America that is the guardians of righteousness. Baloney. I read something online that I thought was an excellent way of saying it. Uh, just yesterday, I believe, a man said, you know, Republicans are people who will let a hundred people go hungry for fear that one of those people is fraudulent. Said Democrats are those who will feed a hundred because they want to make sure if one of those people is not fraudulent that they've eaten. Hello now. I'm going to tell you that's the truth. I've spoken with family members who are Christians, quote unquote, and they will sit there and they will toe the party line and they will preach the Republican message. Oh, if a man doesn't eat, uh, doesn't work, then he ought not to eat. Bless God, that's what the Bible said. Uh, yeah, but what about that man's kids? I'm going to tell you, so if i got to put food in that man's mouth in order to make sure his kids eat, I'm going to do it. What about that man's wife? Does she have to suffer because she married a lazy man? Because she married somebody with no, uh, uh, you know, desire to work or to do anything? Hello now, with no ambition? No, I'm going to make sure she eats. And if he has to eat so she can eat, then so be it. Am I telling the truth? I talked about it just, I think, last week. Tommy and I were contacted by an old friend of his this last week. Bless his heart, he's living in Mississippi. We, I thought he was local at first based on his uh, a profile I saw online. I thought he was living local, and Tommy told me, he said, he's going through an awful hard time. He doesn't have food. He, he's broke. And I said to Tommy, I said, well, find out his address. Get his address. So we've got plenty of food. We'll put, we'll put together a big old, what they used to call years ago, a pounding. What they used to call it. Put together pounds of food, you know. I said, we'll put together a bunch of food in boxes and we'll carry it out to him. Well, he got the address, found out he was living in Mississippi. I said, doggone it, that kind of changes things a little. That kind of forces our hand a little. I said, we obviously we can't carry him food if he's in Mississippi. So we started trying to think of what we could do and we're going to do it through the church so that the church will get credit for helping this person. And uh, so we made some decisions and we figured some things out and I was able to go online and I ordered some food, some meals that are prepared and you don't have to refrigerate them and you can heat them up in the microwave. I eat them myself, especially when I'm up at my cabin uh, in Oklahoma and they're, they're small but they're good, they're tasty. And they're good. I mean, they, they fill you up. It, it's good enough for me anyway. Of course, I don't eat a large portion these days. So anyway, I was able to go online and through uh, Amazon, I was able to order him about 20 meals, I think, or 24 or something like that, because it was he and his wife, and I wanted to make sure they had enough to carry them a while. And I ordered those, and he would get them within a couple of days, and then we sent him a gift card to Amazon. So, And I told him in a note with the gift card, I said, you can order groceries through Amazon and they'll deliver it. Uh, you know, so I let him know. But we sent him a gift card to Amazon. And then I went and I sent him a few dollars uh, on PayPal because I had his email address so I could send him some money in case he needed to go immediately right away and buy some food and stuff, you know. 
So, you know, I look at things differently than the world looks at things. When a need is presented to me, if there's any way in the world I can meet that need, by God, I'm going to meet that need. If there's anything I can do, Tommy, I'm going to do it. If that means I've got to clean out my cabinets to make sure somebody else eats, then by God, that's what I'm going to do. You see, I live by faith. Hallelujah. I trust God. I know God's going to take care of me. I know the Lord isn't going to let me go without. So it doesn't matter like that little widow woman. It doesn't matter if I've got a little or a lot. The fact of the matter is, I'm going to think of others before I even think of myself. Because I know I've got a caretaker. I know I've got somebody who's thinking about me and taking care of me, amen. So why in the world should I be slow to respond to a need in someone else's life? I want to tell you today, I'm trying to move along quickly so I don't belabor this too long. As we look around us today, we ought not to be seeing struggle and distress but rather we ought to be seeing the opportunity to give and to do. Everywhere we look in this present circumstance, there is someone in need. In every direction that we look, there is someone in distress. As believers, we ought to be asking, what, Lord, can I do? I'll tell you one thing we can do. We can lend our faith to the situation of others. Say, well, but pastor, you don't understand. I'm so broke, I can't even afford a, a public restroom. Years ago when I was a kid, they used to have restrooms, and you literally had to put a dime in a little device on the door. You put a dime in, you turn it, and that would unlock you. Remember that, booby? You don't remember that? Oh, heavens, yes. Back when I was a kid, they had what they called pay toilets, and you had to pay and a lot of your stores and businesses, they have paid toilets. And that way it helped pay for the upkeep and maintenance. You know, nowadays, most of them are free. But some people say, I haven't even got a dime to use a paid toilet. Lord, I've just given away how old I am. But even when you have no physical, tangible resources that you can help someone else with. You do have something if you're a child of God. In Acts 3, 1 through 8, the Word of God said, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Even when you're broke, even when you don't have anything you think you can give, if you're a born-again, spirit-filled, God-believing child of God, you got something to give. Hallelujah. I, I, anybody who knows me knows. Tommy can tell you. When I drive past a broken-down car on the side of the road, and I see someone sitting in that car. When I go past an accident on the highway, immediately, not, not five seconds later, what do I do? I start to pray. 
Oh God, help that person, Jesus. Help them, Lord. I don't know if they have the resources to, uh, you know, I I make sure every year we belong to AAA because anything I hate is getting broke down on a highway and not having any help. But not everybody can afford AAA. Not everybody has AAA. So I begin to pray for that person. You see, i got something I can offer. Now only a fool believes that prayer is worthless. Hello now. Only a fool believes that prayer has no legitimate value. I'll tell you, I've seen a story on television about two people who died. Both of them were in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the story they told. And both of them shared the same identical experience. Now, these stories were not told at the same time. They were not shared at the same time. But they were on the same show, but at different times. And both of them talked about how, as they were talking to the Lord, there were these powerful, like, lightning bolts coming up through the ground beneath them and rising up into the sky. And they asked the Lord, Lord, what on earth are those? And the Lord said, oh, that's your friends and family praying for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're praying for you. And they wound up coming back. They wound up being restored to life even though they had died. Why? Because somebody was praying. Don't you ever think prayer is a worthless exercise. You're out of your mind. God, God can respond to prayer by sending an angel. Hallelujah. That person broken down on the side of the road. You may not be able to stop. You may not be able to physically help them. But God can send an angel to provide them the assistance they need. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you, I've been there. I believe, I believe there's a time or two God sent an angel my way. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, prayer is important. Faith is important. When we have the opportunity and we don't have the ability to otherwise help someone, we can pray for them. I'm going to tell you one thing that keeps me praying hours and hours a day is Facebook. I look at my Facebook profile and I look at all the needs. I see people losing loved ones. I see people uh, who are sick and struggling with illness and struggling with financial difficulties. And immediately I begin to pray for these people. Immediately while I'm looking at Facebook, I'm praying for these people. And I've created these little memes that I share with people. And some of them say, I'm praying for you. Some of them say, uh, congratulations. Some of them say, uh, get well soon or I hope you feel better and I literally will share that with that person because I want them to know I'm praying for them I'm not just talking it, I'm doing it if you get a meme from me says I'm praying for you, honey I got I got news for you you're being prayed for they've done studies about prayer, literally I read a study one time they said people recovered faster and did better who were being prayed for. Listen to this now. And they did not even know they were being prayed for. Because the way the study was conducted, they had a group praying for certain patients in these hospitals. And they didn't tell these people they had this group over here praying for them. But then they watched their recovery. They watched their progress. And they said, this is scientists. This isn't, this isn't religion. This is scientists. Doctors said, the people who are being prayed for literally showed accelerated recovery. Don't tell me prayer is worthless. Don't tell me lending your faith to someone's struggle is worthless. Don't tell me talking to God on their behalf it's worthless. We can lend our faith to the situation of others. That's one way. That's one way that we're given an opportunity to give. Because giving is an opportunity to demonstrate and to exercise our faith. A lot of people, they love religion. They love Christianity just as long as it never gets practical. 
Just as long as it never touches their wallet. Just as long as it never touches their pocketbook. Just as long as it never touches their pantry. Just as long as they don't have to get up early to go to church. Just as long as they don't have to go to Bible study. Just as long as they don't have to get on their knees and pray. Oh, I love my faith as long as there's nothing required of me. There's nothing necessary that I need do nothing. Then faith, I can talk about the Bible till the cows come home. Just don't ask me, ask me to act upon it. Hello now. Cracks me up how people will gripe and groan about tithing. They'll talk about tithing as though you're trying to cut their head off. And it makes me laugh. It, it makes me chuckle. Because these are the people who tell you they have faith, but they haven't got a lick. Hadn't got a lick. I don't need that person praying for me. I'm going to tell you, the church I grew up in was full of a bunch of Holy Ghost filled, tithe paying, praying, believing people. I'd rather have them praying for me any day of the week than somebody who doesn't like to put feet on their faith. Hello now. In James chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, the Word of God said, If a brother or sister be naked, and destitute of daily food. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, meaning action, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Giving and doing for others, folks, is an opportunity to demonstrate our faith. It's an opportunity to put feet on our faith, to act in faith rather than simply to speak of our faith. The Word of God promises in Luke chapter 6 verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. God says, you know what? The amount of generosity you show is going to determine the level of generosity that's shown back to you. You know, Claude has been extremely generous with this ministry over the last many years. And I'm going to tell you a little secret, and I'm not ashamed to say it. There's a reason why. Because God has seen me give and give and give and give and give and give. He's seen me go into churches that wouldn't even give me a love offering. And when they invited me back, I went again. And when they invited me back, I went again. I preached in one little hole in this church in East Texas for several months. They had no pastor. The pastor's wife was trying to keep the church going. I met her one day. She invited me to come out and preach. I went out and preached. Didn't give me a nickel. But she started inviting me to come back every single Sunday. She literally was using me as an interim pastor. Tommy, I did this for months and never received one nickel. Did I ever complain? No. Did I ever tell her I wouldn't come because I wasn't given a love offering? No. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. I know why God blesses me the way He blesses me today. Because the same measure that you've given, He's going to give it back to you. How does He give it back to you? What does the Word of God say? Shall men give unto your bosom. The Lord said, you know what? If you bless others, if you bless other people, if you bless other men and women, boys and girls, He said that, honey, I will bless you back. And guess what avenue I'm going to use to bless you back? I'm going to bless you back through men and women, boys and girls. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Word of God declares, trying to close today, Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42, He that receiveth you, Receiveth me, Jesus said. And he that receiveth me sent him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet 
in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. I'm going to tell you, it pays to have discernment. It pays to know who a prophet is. Hello now. It pays to know who a genuine man of God is or a genuine woman of God is. It pays to know who the real people are. You know, there are some people just sit around and as an excuse for not ever supporting the church or not ever supporting the ministry, they find fault with the pastor and they find fault with the preacher. And, you know, and that way they... they, they are able to get away with doing nothing to help support that person. But you know what's funny? If that person is genuinely a man or woman of God, and you're just finding fault with them, because all of us got faults, and they know one of us perfect, then your failure to bless them and help them and receive them, all because you want to find fault with them, all it's doing is costing you. It's not costing them nothing. But it's costing you. You're losing out on the blessing. That's why the Word of God said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, well, in order to receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you've got to be able to identify they're a prophet. Hello now. There's a lot of people give to Kenneth Copeland. A lot of people give to this one and that one. And they never get back. I've heard more believers complain about how God doesn't keep his word. And how, oh, I've given to this one and given to that one. And I've never gotten back like they said I would. Um, honey, it's because you haven't got a lick of discernment. The word of God said, give to a prophet in the name of a prophet. Not give to a false prophet in the name of a prophet. Oh, my word, have mercy. Lastly, today, for those who want to complain about tithing, they want to say, oh, tithing, that's an Old Testament law. That's an Old Testament principle. Well, it is, but it's also one that was carried over into the New Testament by the teaching of the apostles. I'm not going to go into great detail on that today. I've taught on it. You can go to our uh, YouTube site. We've got a Bible study. That uh, I believe it's in, it's titled The Truth About Biblical Giving. You can watch that Bible study series and find more detail. But listen to what the Word of God said in Malachi 3 and 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Meat in mine house. God is saying, there's somebody in my house that needs to eat. Well, guess who that is? It's the ministers. It's the priests. It's the ministers. Tithing was never designed, never designed, never designed to support a building, to support a structure, to support a campus, to support electric bills and light bills. No, 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 no. Tithing was designed to support the Levites. It was designed to support the ministry. The Apostle Paul taught in the New Testament that God hath ordained that they which preach the gospel ought to live of the gospel. So I've got news for you. Don't tell me tithing's an Old Testament principle and it has no application in the world today. Baloney. And i got news for you, honey. The only person who's losing out when you explain away tithing. I know pastors who refuse to teach tithing because they're afraid of the reaction they're going to get from their people. And all they're doing is stealing the opportunity from those people to receive the blessing of God. Why? Because giving is an opportunity to exercise your faith. It's an opportunity to walk in faith, to put feet on your faith. The Lord said... Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I told Tommy years ago, we've been together for a few years, he was coming to our church. 
And every time you turned around, he and I were having to dip into our own finances to pay church bills. I mean, it was constant. Constant. Every month we had to pay the rent, had to pay the light bill, had to pay the uh, internet bill, had to pay everything. Tommy and I were doing it on our own most of the time for years. I'm not talking about for a month or two. I'm talking for years. Finally, one day, Tommy was a little grumpy about it. You know, every time we turn around, we're having to pay for the book. And I looked at him, I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, if you would just tithe, I said, if you would just tithe, I'll make certain that we operate within the confines of what we receive, and you won't have to give any more than your tithe. Did I tell the truth? Say it out loud. Yes. He started tithing. Guess what happened? Oh my God, I want. I just am in the mood to shout a little today. I'll tell you what. He started tithing, folks. You think I'm telling a fib? That man started to get uh, bonuses at his job. He started to get raises. He started to get promoted at his job. He was on a fast track. Now he's the vice president in his area of his bank. I'm telling you, folks. Tithing works. Am I up here begging you to give? No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not begging you to give to me or anybody else. What I'm trying to tell you is, tithing is just one aspect of giving. But I'm talking about giving of ourselves. You know, you don't have to just give groceries. You don't have to just give money. You don't have to just give water. There are times when somebody is trying to move and they need help moving and you can help them move. Hello now. There are times when people just need somebody to come to the hospital and spend an hour or two with them because they're bored out of their mind and they need a little company. Go to the hospital. Don't I do that, Booby? When I go to the hospital, whenever I go to a hospital to visit people, I always try to spend an hour or two there at least because I know I've been in hospitals. I know how boring. Now, if they have family and friends that are around them, I don't take up that much time. But if they're alone, you know it all, I'll try to spend time with them because I know how boring and how depressing, you know, and all that it can be. If I hear somebody, Tommy, I'll tell you, if I hear that somebody's in a hospital, I don't have to know this person. I don't have to know anything about them. But I've even said to Tommy, I said, well, you know, there's an opportunity for you to go. I said, you can go visit them. I don't want to go, man. I don't want to go. I said, said, booby, you don't understand the principle. Given it shall be given unto you. God has opened up an opportunity for you to give. Hallelujah. And giving us an opportunity to demonstrate your faith, to walk in faith. And I'm going to tell you, when you start putting feet on your faith, God starts putting blessing in your bank account. Hallelujah. And I don't mean bank account money. I mean bank account in your life. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, giving is an opportunity. When you see an opportunity to give, God has given you an opportunity to exercise faith. Whether it's an opportunity to pray for that person, to pray for their situation, whether it's an opportunity to give them some food or give them some assistance or give them some help. Whatever the case may be, folks, giving is an opportunity. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Please?